That's one thing I'll try and drop now, but once you get up in hills, then it's all the time. That's huge. Unless the French folks get involved. <laughs> I there we go. We're going to get underway here. Yeah. Um, anybody hanging out? Everybody is in. Nobody's in the waiting room at the moment. We are live to Facebook. Um, all right. Well, I apologize to people in the room who are not going to be able to see. Um, see slides, but that's OK. Uh, yeah, if you want. <laughs> All right. So, yes, come on over. Um, so, hello, folks who will be joining later on recording, who are or who are on Facebook. Um, we we are excited to be in, on our uh, uh, in a hybrid meeting for the first time in I don't know how long. Um, I think for our regular membership meeting, we have not been in person since pre-pandemic. Um, I think the, the forum was the last time we did something hybrid. Um, and we are having all sorts of tech issues this week across all sorts of different platforms. Um, so people who just got, just saw the meeting notice this morning, um, are we had domain issues. So... We were sending emails out and no one was receiving them for a few days. So that's fun. Um, we are here at the uh, Senior Center of West Seattle. So you can see me here, Michael Taylor Judd, I'm chair. Um, hopefully folks are seeing slides, yeah. Um, we have a mobile cam set up that is currently focused on our vice chair, Kate Wells, as well as one of our uh, D1 city council candidates. Um, and her campaign manager. Um, we've got a few other folks kind of spread around the room here. Um, and uh, we will get underway with some intros and things and we're we're shifting around the agenda a little bit so we can we can jump to our uh, to our candidate Marin Costa who is with us and then she will scoot out of the room and then we'll be jumping to, Seattle Estad, and so we're just going to roll with things like we always do because we're a community group and we're all used to that. Um, so tonight's agenda, welcome and introduction. I don't believe we have previous minutes from May, do we? Yeah, so did. 
So I, we did see them. Um, I mean, uh, uh, there's uh, what three three board members in the room and John online. Like, I do we all we oh and there's Phil. So uh, the uh, our board. I know I would have read them when you sent them out. Do we trust Kate or do we want to wait and review them again and boot approving meeting minutes to the next meeting? I don't hear any objections. Um, I would move to approve our previous meeting minutes from May. Do I have a second? Second from Larry. All those in favor say aye. All right, all those opposed? Um, hearing none and hearing no uh, objections on here from John, um, we will move ahead. So I've got old business up here, but we will come back to that. Um, tonight's agenda, we will... Uh, we will be having a conversation with Seattle Department of Transportation um, in, a, in a few short minutes about their draft Seattle Transportation Plan. Um, you can see on the screen um, the really long web address to check that out. Uh, we are having conversations with our District 1 City Council candidate. Um, as I said, Marin Costa is in the room with us there. And oops, I duplicated things here. So uh, don't put HTTPS twice. Um, but you can go to MarinForSeattle.org. Um, and uh, Marin, thank you, sorry. Um, and then a little later, uh, we will be joined by Rob Saka. Um, and uh, before we wrap, um, oops, before we wrap, we will be talking um, a little bit about some new business um, and uh, talking about uh, what's happening with Sound Transit and things happening in the community here around Rethink the Link. Um, as I said, we're going to shift uh, Marin up to the top of the, of the agenda so she can get out. Um, and so before we do that, uh, very quickly, um, if you have not been with us before, uh, the West Seattle Transportation Coalition is a peninsula-wide organization working to address transportation and commuting challenges for the nearly 100,000 people living and working on the West Seattle Peninsula. The coalition accomplishes this by doing things like securing the support of residents here on the peninsula, engaging elected officials at all levels, uh, partnering with government agencies, as you'll see us doing tonight with SBI, um, engaging with businesses, community organizations, neighborhood groups, and individuals um, in order to educate and collect feedback. And part of that, as you uh, know over the years, has been inviting candidates um, in when we're trying to figure out who's going to be our best uh, our best new reps. Um, so we're excited to have our guests this evening for that. Um, our goals are uh, to seek affordable and equitable transportation options, particularly in historically underserved neighborhoods, a transportation network that moves people and goods in an environmentally sustainable manner, and that investments in transportation infrastructure uh, match Seattle's growth. Um, so hopefully we'll be chatting with our candidates about what they think about transportation impact fees, um, which are part of that. Um, our priorities for 2023 have been supporting Sound Transit 3, uh, monitoring the Fauntleroy Ferry Terminal uh, replacement, um, West Marginal Way Southwest Safety Corridor Project and Projected Bike Lane, which um, as many folks know was constructed. Um, there's a big November there because as that we will have other guests from SDOT joining us in November at our next meeting. Uh, to report on tracking and data they've been doing around that to see uh, how that's going, who's using it, have they heard complaints, et cetera. Um, we've been meaning to talk more about King, King County Metro bus routes planning, um, and we haven't really been great on top of that, but that might be another good topic um, to chat with our uh, candidates about. And then, uh, you know, it's kind of italicized there, but knowing that coming up next year um, is going to be a move Seattle levy renewal um, planning will kick off because that'll be on the ballot in 2024. Um, I, I think this is public. I hope I'm not revealing anything that is not yet. Um, but my understanding uh, from a conversation I had earlier today is that uh, Dan Anderson at SDOT is going to be leading uh, the outreach around that. Um, and so for those of us who've been around for a while, uh, we may know Dan. Um, people may remember Dan when he was, I believe he was at Metro when we, a bunch of us first met him. Um, and so very excited to have a familiar face um, who will be helping lead those efforts. So I see. 
All right, um, introductions. Um, since we're in person, we may do a really quick um, introductions. Um, there, there is a check-in question, um, but I don't think we'll, maybe we'll just do a yes or no. So uh, we typically do names, uh, any pro your pronouns, what neighborhood you're from. Um, our check-in question was gonna be, would you ditch your car for a week in October? Maybe just a yes or no, and not really go too much into that. Um, so why don't we pause there uh, really quickly. Um, uh, I'll say again, I'm Michael Taylor Judd. I'm chair of the West Seattle Transportation Coalition. Um, I use he, him pronoun, um, and I'm in the North Delridge neighborhood. Um, and I, I don't know that I won't be using a car in October, but we're a one car uh, family. So I am often walking around the bus. Um, and I am just going to go to my left. Yeah. I'm not tired. Uh, I am a avid cycler, and so I don't the car very much anyway, so I'm not sure whether I will have to in that week or not. All right. Hey. Hi, I'm a board member for the coach. Um, in terms of car, absolutely. My car and my wife and I in two weeks can go to the Cascade Blue. All right. Um, we got next. And I don't know, with the little square boxes online, but um, Kyler sporting a fabulous Metro uh, baseball cap there. So that's always a good thing. All right, last. All right. All right. And uh, John, I don't know if you want to uh, unmute, unmute yourself there or just drop something in the chat. chat. 
Oh, there's, there's something, something to chat. Um, no, no can, can do. do. Gotta, Gotta schlep kids. kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, we, we will move, move along then. Um, um, very, very quickly, quickly before, before we uh, turn things, things over to Marin, um, we, have, we are talking about what would you do with a week off? Because, because if you're not familiar, familiar the week without driving is happening, happening October 2nd to the 8th. 2023, you can check out uh, the web address up there at the top of the window. Um, I don't think I'm going to read all of that. I'm just going to say um, that they created the Week Without Driving Challenge so that policymakers, elected leaders, and uh, transportation uh, professionals can begin to understand um, what experience is like for uh, non-drivers who have to access all these different things. Um, and I want to particularly highlight this. I mean, check out Disability Rights Washington, um, who we should have in again at some point. They are a fabulous organization doing great work. Um, but in particular, they have reached really high this year. Um, they, uh, they have a hashtag, Week Without Driving. Um, and after two successful years of hosting this challenge in Washington State, including getting a proclamation out of Governor Jay Inslee, this year they're going national in partnership with America Walks, and they're working with advocacy groups across all 50 states in Puerto Rico to try and get uh, officials and uh, you know community leaders and things all across the country to participate this year. So um, certainly wish them luck with that. Um, and, uh, and uh, yes, yes Anna Zivart, Z I believe is how she pronounces it. Um, all, all right, and so, uh, without, without further ado, we are going to jump ahead here. here. Um, again, again, we, we have, have one of our candidates, candidates with us, with us um, early, early uh, uh, Marin Costa. Costa. You can, can go to marinforseattle.org. She is one of the two district one candidates who will be on the final election ballot. And do we want to switch? You want, you want to switch, switch to your, your laptop, laptop then for mine? Well, well, I, I, I can, can turn, turn mine. I'll, I'll turn mine. Yep. Yep. Um, just repeat the question. Yep. Yep. Like if you repeat the question, yeah. they yeah. can hear the audio. Yeah. Yep. Testing, testing. <laughs> okay. um, Should I just have my sound off? Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't think we've got anybody that in there sure. right now to ask questions. Yeah, is this better? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so we just want to have a conversation. So, really, it's, it would start out with telling us, you know, sort of around transportation. What do you know about us? What do you know about transportation uh, here in West Seattle? Um, what do you think uh, you're hearing at the doors, or what do you think are yeah. priorities? Yeah. Okay. Maybe start with a bit about yourself. Too. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know how much everyone knows about me. I've been in West Seattle for 21 years, Seattle for 33 years. I'm a mom, kids in public schools, two of my own, two step. So they're all 15 and 17. <laughs> um, I, you know, had a bunch of jobs here, but when Seattle became a tech town, I became a tech worker and I worked at Adobe, uh, Amazon, uh, Microsoft. And then, you know, I got to the point where I decided I really wanted to solve problems for my city instead of for billionaires. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I want to put all my energy into helping, you know, make, make meaningful change here. We have some really big problems that we know we're facing um, public safety and homelessness and, and, uh, affordable housing are kind of top on the list. And then for, for me, you know, right, right after that is climate and climate justice. So that's a big piece of well, why I really care about transportation, public transportation, and y'all, I'm sure y'all understand that. And then workers' rights and just making sure that the city works for people that work, want to work and live in the city. Um, it's getting harder and harder to do that. Um, and public transit also fits in 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 there. Um, so what I know and care about uh, with um, public transit is, um, you know, that 
60% of our carbon footprint is individual cars. We need to get people out of individual cars as much as we can. Um, we know that we also need density in our city. So that makes an even more need for public transit and more need to stop having big parking lots. <laughs> you know, because we have to, you know, keep the density in the housing, not in the in the parking. Um, you know, as we move, as we grow, we will make it work. Um, but we have several issues in District One on pu on public transit. I mean, I'm a C line rider. It works pretty well for me. I'm pretty close. I walk to the junction. Um, C line, boom, downtown. That was great. I did that every day. Um, saved a ton of money on parking. <laughs> um, but some of the smaller lines, you know, aside from the rapid ride lines, are um, fairly undependable. Pretty long wait times in between. I know people in Admiral feel like they um, are in kind of a transit desert. Uh, we don't have a lot of good east-west uh, routes. So, you know, buses and 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 bike lanes both um and uh we just need to have more public transit um we're going to need to solve the problems that the bus drivers are facing so that we can keep buses on the roads um you know good jobs and make sure that public transit is safe so it comes into public safety um and uh you know train some more mechanics get our kids learning the trades in the schools so that they can come out with living wage jobs and help our city. Um, uh, so all those sorts of things. Um, I know a bit about some of you. I have met with some of you. I know about Skylink. I know about um, Skylink. That's the right name, right? That's, that's all, yeah. 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 And we've met with, I don't know if any of you know, Gary Riefel, Riefel? I don't know. is actually his son is my son's best friend and but they live in the Andover neighborhood that's you know recently done the walk it was last Avalon, Sunday or yeah. yeah Avalon I'm sorry what did I say Andover Andover you li you live on Andover yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry. it's been a long day I'm talking a lot today um yeah so the um the Avalon neighborhood um I've also met with the director of the um daycare center that is in the new core um, building and found out that, you know, the amount of money they're, that they're going to be paid to move is not at all the amount of money that they need to reset up their business. And it's very hard to even find a space in the first place. So like lots of um, impacts here. And so, um, we know, we have the, the transportation plan. I love the focus on equity. I think that's also incredibly important. Um, and I'm really happy to see the city is kind of putting that lens front and center in everything that we do. And we need to do that. Um, but we also need to, you know, we, the link is going to, I, I'm for the link because the whole city is going to be linked to the link. I don't think we want to be unlinked. I think it's a good investment. We just want to make sure that it is as, you know, least disruptive and most usable. And then I think we've done a decent job of exploring a lot of options and we just have to keep hammering it home. But I would love to hear from all of you as well. What do you want to hear from me or what are you what are your, your concerns? Um, I'm a you know obviously I got the urbanist uh, endorsement and I'm a big fan. <laughs> I would love to see it actually be free, but I don't know how possible that is. Oh, trans, yeah. Yeah. Public transit. And then I love those of you who are brave enough to ride a bike. I am not. <laughs> She's our warrior. Yeah. <laughs> I'm learning some tips because I, I really want to get there. I just. <laughs> so. I will defer very quickly to the board members. If Kate or Larry or Bill had a question, they absolutely would do it. Otherwise, it's something about whoever wants to ask questions. I'll jump in and ask one. Um, I, I know we've talked about this before. So, us as a board, we were talking about traffic impact fees. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
there's some discussion and even as a board we've discussed it we were kind of on mm -hmm. still trying to decide so i'm um, mm -hmm. giving that some thought kind of what are your thoughts on um mm -hmm. yeah well i'm probably with all of you in that i would want to figure this out a little more i think that what we know is that a lot of times impact fees have unintended consequences they either slow things down or they you know push developers to do something entirely different um but i also know that you know, we do need to keep upgrading our infrastructure. Um, I think there might be other ways we can do that besides uh, other than impact fees, which often also get passed along to the renters anyways. Um, so I, I would love to hear what your what your discussion has been on that one and what 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 weighs out for you? What has been the what's the polemic here? Mixed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some people like really for and some people really against. Is that kind of yeah? <laughs> okay. Interesting. Say more. This is not this is not really a discussion that has been um brought up very much in these transportation conversations. So I don't know if you guys are leading the way on this or uh <laughs> I'll just jump in and say that I've got the same concerns you brought up. You know, will developers um change what they build? Will they not build if um and will renters have to pay for infrastructure that everybody cost, yeah. uses mm -hmm. and benefits from. That's my two cents. Mm -hmm. And then what's the, who can represent the flip side? <laughs> I mean, for me, a couple of things that come back to mind. One, I, like, I, I think the arguments from developers are completely ridiculous. Like, there, there is no concern about building in Seattle. We are so underwater on housing in Seattle, and we have so much money in, in Seattle that there is no developer who's going to leave because they don't want to pay it. And they're literally paying it anywhere else in the state. So unless they're a developer that only works within the city limits of Seattle, they know how to deal with this. That's yeah. um, it, to me, it, it's it's one of those struggle things. It's like rent control. Like the data is really clear, rent control is really good for people who already are in apartments and it increases the price mm -hmm. of people coming. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think mm -hmm. the same thing would happen here mm -hmm. is that people who already live in, in Seattle, it's gonna be really good for them. If you're looking to buy new housing, new housing is gonna end up being pricier because they will pass those costs along. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what we need to decide. Um, I'm in favor of fees because we were promised like 20 years ago that part of doing urban villages mm -hmm. is we're going to mm -hmm. focus city investment into those villages and encourage people to be there. Mm -hmm. um, but so we did that. We upzoned, we built tons of new apartment buildings like we can see here in the West Seattle Junction. And then we didn't necessarily tag infrastructure development yeah. into those areas so we're lucky in the junction that we do have rapid ride and we've maintained really good bus service but at the same time you can see things like the recent power outages that have been happening around that seattle <laughs> where the city didn't really invest in that yeah. uh, which wouldn't be covered by the transportation in yeah piece. but that's the that's yeah, an example I, yeah. where we haven't made the investments to follow where we go yeah Kyler was so, just saying, does the power go out in West Seattle a lot? Because <laughs> he's like kind of new to West Seattle. So. Yeah. <laughs> Either it gets reported really well yeah. in the blog, or we actually lose power more often than it seems like other people do. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'm hearing that on the doors too. A lot of people saying, you know, we're going to need to upgrade the electrical grid. We need to bury the wires. Um, you know, we have uh, water pipes and, <laughs> you know, just all the, all the things streets and curbs and cuts and roads and you know bridges and you know that need to be done i mean the good news about infrastructure though is it does usually it's usually an investment that comes back to you creates jobs pays itself back um and it's yeah it's the question of who who pays the bill at the time i think i'll have one more thing which is a good point brought up by a woman is we we don't do a good like there's not a good job of focusing where money will be the same same complaints that have come up 
around um, the uh, multi-family housing exemption. Mm -hmm. right? yep. If you're going, if a developer, I'll just say the junction. Right? If a developer is going to build in the junction and pay into that, then we expect to see affordable housing in the junction, yep. or at least you're buying in Seattle. Not that that money is building affordable housing in Beacon Hill yep. or Lake City. Not that we don't need it there, but like we want those things tied. And so same yep. thing, if we're going to charge a developer transportation impact fees in West Seattle, we expect that's going to be invested in transportation <laughs> yes. improvements in West Seattle, <laughs> not in the city. Yeah. And I think that's a really strong concern because the city is not good at keeping things yep. in a district or a neighborhood. Yep. So yep. A district or yep. a neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I have a question. Um, if the uh, city council committees stay the same, which ones are you interested <laughs> in serving on? That is a question I get asked uh, very frequently. Um, it, it depends so much on what the group of people, who is the group of people that's in there with me. Yeah. You know, I really, honestly, the way I would answer that question is I want to be able to provide as much value as I can. And so if I am needed here because we don't have somebody who's strong in this area, then I will be there. You know, so I want to see who I'm in with. I mean, obviously I have, um, you know, I like transportation, land use, uh, climate, renters, you know, sustainability, all of those things. I would, I, I could love any of them, even public safety. I mean, I would, I would consider public safety. <laughs> it's sort of sort of like, do you do you really want to hang on that cross? Do you want to die on that mountain? But you know, somebody needs someone's going to need to step up because um, you know, that Lisa's leading that now, and she won't be there. So, and we know we're going to have that committee. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of a little bit of a non-answer, but there. <laughs> if I had a crystal ball. <laughs> Oh. Uh, I'll go ahead and throw another one out. Um, uh, if, if everybody didn't know, the West Vale Bridge closed down for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, yeah, there's a lot of discussion. Maybe that was because not enough money was put into a lot of the inspection and maintenance of that bridge, as well as other infrastructure in the area that, you know, has a lot of business and stuff. They kind of want the shiny new bridge and stuff versus the repairing the five year old one. So, I just understand that that's maybe kind of a, a, a more of a priority as we put in section maintenance of some of our some of our infrastructure. I mean, I know I'm frustrated driving across West Seattle Bridge, and as I'm getting to five, uh, it's like the Oregon Trail. It's like, well, why wasn't it fixed? Wow, the bridge was down. You know, so I don't know if you have some thoughts about that. Just well, maybe, there is I, maybe a resource being allocated in <clears throat> for inspection or repair. Right, so, right, and it does sound like there was some baton pass errors, like. The county owns the off ramp and the city owns the road. And so they fix the road, but they don't fix the ramp because, you know, it's just like it was something like that. You know, it was like, oh, wow, you know, this, that makes sense. <laughs> that, but it's context, not an excuse. <laughs> you know? Um, I know we have 77 bridges that are in need of repair. Um, and I know that we, I think people are pretty frustrated and it d does seem like we didn't do, and I'm not pointing fingers at any one person because I'm sure it wasn't any one person's you know, fault, but it does seem like we could have done a lot better job on the West Seattle Bridge. Like we knew that it was need in need of repair um, much uh, sooner than we actually started to repair it. And, um, you know, I was touring the port the other day and they said, we were actually told we had to have contingency plans in case a big chunk of it fell down and made a wave, you know, like they were really having to plan for the fact that it literally might fall down. And of course, they weren't telling any of us that, you know, I was also talking to somebody who was in a meeting about the bridge at the time, and there was a live mic that somebody didn't know was on. <laughs> was, that, was that even maybe you that told me that story? I don't know. No, it was and, and he just showed me the document that was issued by the party. They were actually afraid of high bridge would fall down on the low bridge and take like a lot. Yeah. And yeah. they uh, all shipping you know, stopped. Yeah. And so they cleared the, the rest of the ownership. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's certainly, I don't know what is breaking down there. I mean, being outside as much as y'all are and, you know, there's going to be a lot of new faces in, in city council. So it's hard for me to totally know what what broke down there. But um, it seems like an investigation and an audit is due. <laughs> well, Maintenance budget and consistently about eighty five percent of maintenance budget. So <clears throat> they they scramble for the panic situation. Mm -hmm. so yeah. The panic situation occurs. They yeah. The they're putting out the biggest fire. And yeah. this is a panic situation. Yeah. And we'll yeah. Talk to and so once again, too, it does come down to you know money. Yeah, everything, all of our big problems come down to how we're going to pay for it. So the question is, why do people think we can't afford to maintain? So how you would be the cart before that horse, mm -hmm. I mean, the, horse the horse before that cart instead of mm -hmm. who's behind it. Mm -hmm. um, how can we build to and, and add a budget for maintenance so that that's that's part of the mm -hmm. of before we build new stuff yeah. now, shiny object another shiny object breaks and go well it's both another shiny object <laughs> yeah Moosey Levy is going to shape so much of what happens next, too. So um, maybe a lot more maintenance and a lot fewer shiny objects. And making sure we fund, you know, we fund it sufficiently. Yep. Mm -hmm. We're going to just be on the Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I'm curious about you, whether you would be pleaded into a no-build option for the link. Uh, given that in 20 years, we don't carry any more tax increase than buses do now. And if you add fan cool and ride share, they carry more than light rail they will. Also, the cost, also the carbon footprint, which is going to take 600 years to medically, according to the EIS plan. Mm -hmm. um, so the drawbacks are so legendary. Um, the, well, those are two are. Think about this. So we had to build this and close dozens of businesses through hundreds of people in the city. Well, ironically, people wouldn't be riding wide rail if they were able to live here for long. So I'm so curious, show of hands, who who's no build? There are two other board members who aren't there who are um, one is tattooed and one is the best. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I love life. I do that in Columbia yeah, City. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love it. Mm -hmm. And if if the ridership warrants it, you know, it takes a lot of infrastructure to build. Mm -hmm. But then if there is enough ridership, yeah, absolutely. I grew up in Germany mm -hmm. with trains and with mm -hmm. buses and so on. So I love it. It's another shiny object. <laughs> love to yeah. sign, uh, cut the ribbon. But is that the right solution for West Seattle? Mm -hmm. the, the way it is spread out, you know, we cut bus service down on, uh, on, on Beach Drive, on a lot of other places have no bus service mm -hmm. or at least no bus service on the weekends, yep. you know. Uh, can we get actually? We believe that we can get better if we could take that money and apply it to buses, to uh, to increasing and uh, frequency and service mm -hmm. for bus services. We could actually get more than what Sound Transit is projecting mm -hmm. to take off hundreds yeah. riders off of the twelve thousand. Uh, now 120,000 daily riders on the West Seattle Bridge. 100 driver, 100 dry, riders are not going to make a difference, but the 614,000 ton of carbon is going to be mostly on in Georgetown. Well, we meaning they are already suffering from yep. all the pollution, and West Seattle will get some of that. Do we really need to add that? Or do we have better places mm -hmm. 
uh, to make those investments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, buses also are more flexible. Yeah, I, I love the flexibility of buses. I forgot to add, add the Microsoft cameras on a Starbucks buses with operate faculty and very large numbers of people, in addition to Metro, in addition to Van Um, This is just a heads up to um, an option that we could choose that's much less expensive. The no bill is not going to stop the ST3 projects for all the way. Mm -hmm. It's not going to stop. Them. Yeah, it's just the, the, the West Seattle link. Yeah. It's only going to sort of rethink uh, the segment um, between Bell and actually Bell West Seattle's 3 million tons of carbon. Just the CID here is 60,000 tons. Um, which doesn't Overwhelming majority of that three million is the the Ballard side though with the tunneling right. and yeah it's like two point three of the three yeah yeah but you have to add that so far they've cut fourteen thousand trees just to get from the north to the south and they're going to cut a and Seattle has lost two hundred fifty five acres of tree canopy so far Santa Rosa is going to cut at least three more acres of tree canopy mm -hmm. and they have barely replaced any of the trees we already cut. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Oh, right. So if you have if that reduces BMTs by a lot, mm -hmm. yeah, that might make sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. But here we are talking about forecast of 100 or maybe 400 daily riders. Mm -hmm. so why, why are we thinking only 400 daily riders? That's what Sound Transit is projecting because that's what they think we are. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. Part of the challenge talk to them about so that yeah, they're hard most to of down. <laughs> the riders will come on buses. Because we only have two or three light rail stations mm -hmm. in West Seattle. So the majority of the riders will come by bus, bus to the link and yeah. wait, then go to Soto for a while until the downtown connection is finished, which still is debated. Yeah. So we are building this ahead of time, knowing that we will force bus riders in particular from the from the what is that to the as in like the Ballard piece is going to be coming later? The Ballard piece is, go, yeah. is going to be separate, right? And like a year or two later. No, no, I think it's earlier. Seven years later, right? That was earlier. Yeah, Ballard. It was. <laughs> oh, yeah. getting later. They, okay, they push it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't have the money for the for the Ballard piece because we are now decided to build West Seattle first. But it will make transit ridership really more challenging because now you force two transfers to a uh, to to ride bus riders. What they're doing with those downtown stations is a mess. That, that is a whole different. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole different discussion. Okay, we're taking yeah. enough time on this. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your. Yeah, I want to. We want to give you the last word and respect your time. That needs yeah. To yeah, I need to head over to the transitional resources yeah, event that's happening. Yeah. You'll be on my room getting done. Oh, okay, okay. Um, well, thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, I hope that you have, you know, definitely feel free to contact me. We ha we can leave a few flyers here, web website here, um, Kyler at uh, Marn for Seattle .org or marn at marncosta.com if you prefer. I, I hate email, but. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, My inbox gets emptied every day. It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I really appreciate the time and um, uh, I'd like a really good discussion. I've, I've always had good discussions with you all and um, I hope that continues and I'm, I'm here to be an advocate for our community and what is best for our community. Regardless of what happens, um, thank you for joining us tonight. And you're always welcome back, either as right. a future council member or. Yes, I would a, definitely hope to come back in that case. All right, great. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for moving the schedule around a little. All right. Um, I am going, going to switch, switch over here real, real quick. quick. Um, so, so we, we do have, have um, our next guest with us. Um, 
we are, uh, we, are, we, are, we, are we are hopping around, around a little bit, bit um, on, on the agenda. agenda. Um, so, so I apologize, we're, 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 we're running, running a little late. late. Uh, we, we have, have a Rad, Rad, Radcliffe Dacane. Do I have it right? You've been with us before. I'm trying to remember. Uh, uh, who's a principal planner with uh, uh, S -Dot. S -Dot. Um, who's here to talk to us about the draft Seattle transportation, transportation plan. plan. Um, again, again, for those, for those of us who are jo for those, for those who are joining us late, us late we've been having a raft of uh, tech difficulties this, this week, week on all sorts of different platforms. platforms. Um, and so, so we are a hybrid. Uh, some, some of us are here in person in, person in uh, the, the senior, senior center of West Seattle, Seattle up in the junction. junction. Um, but, but we, we, had we had a couple problems, problems with the projector, and so we are making do with duct tape and chewing gum and whatnot to get people in. But our next guest, um, is, is joining, joining us online, online um, and, and has slides, slides to share. To share. So, so I will stop sharing um, and, and let him um, pop those, those slides up. up. Uh, for, for those of us in the room, room we'll ask people to sort of gather, gather around the, one, one of the laptops, laptops that's in the room. room. Uh, if you, you do want to see the slides or come back later um, and check out the recordings um, on YouTube or on Facebook. Um, but take it away, Radcliffe. Thank you, Michael. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I'll take that as a yes. You can hear me okay? Michael, thumbs up. You can hear me? All right, great. Um, again, Radcliffe Deck and I from SDOT. Um, I'm a principal planner in the policy and planning group and uh, happy to be here to talk to you uh, and share with you the, the draft uh, Seattle Transportation Plan. Uh, I'll give a high level overview of the document and uh, how you can participate and provide uh, comments. Uh, if you'll bear with me one moment, I'm getting the, uh, sharing the screen. All right, how does that look? It looks okay. Great. Um, all right, let's let's jump right into it. Um, so yes, I'll just go over the the comment period for the STP. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the two parts. Part one is sort of the high level vision document, and then part two is the more detailed, hefty technical report. And then we'll just give you some highlights of. Some of the key moves and then let's just jump into a q a discussion we'd love to hear your comments and thoughts i was just overhearing some of your conversation already uh, about some of the transportation issues uh in, in west seattle and we'd love to continue that conversation with you um the the comment period is through october 23rd so there's a couple weeks yet uh to review uh these two documents, uh, like I said, part one is a vision document, very uh, thin, easy to read. And then part two is a much thicker volume that includes uh, the, the more detailed elements uh, uh, of the plan. Um, one way to see it is through the, the website. Probably the best way uh, to do this is, is through the Seattle Transportation Plan uh, engagement portal and the website is there. Uh, Michael, I'll send you a copy of this uh, deck as well. So if you want to circulate it or send the link to everybody, you can just connect right there. And once you get to this site, part one and part two, they've got uh, tab sections and you'll be able to uh, scroll through and, and click a tab and see each of the, the um, uh, component pieces of the plan and you're welcome to comment directly in the comment box where that red arrow is pointing there. So in every section you can do that and that way you don't have to you know, read the whole document and then write up a, a comment and, and then send it to us by email. Surely you could do that if you wanted to, but uh, if you wanted to spend you know, a day with one and then skip, a, a, take a break a couple of days and then go to another one, you're, you're uh, Welcome to directly submit your comments uh, by each, uh, by section. So let's jump right into part one, uh, the vision that uh, we're showing, sharing, uh, community generated and what we've heard, Seattle is an equitable, vibrant 
diverse city in which moving around is safe, sustainable, and just. All people and businesses can access their daily needs and feel connected to their community. So hope you see yourself in here in one way or another. You know, vision statements are very broad and lofty. Um, um, but this has been a process of talking to community members, to representing people, and talking to businesses, the freight community, and then being able to represent that uh, in, in the vision. But really where it dies down is when we get into our goals, really these, uh, I would think of the STP goals as principles or outcomes that we want. We want uh, uh, more safety, uh, more equity, more sustainability, more mobility, uh, livability, and uh, here it says stewardship, but we've changed that to uh, maintenance and modernization. So really being able to uh, find more funding to take care of the infrastructure that we uh, already have. And of course, any new infrastructure that comes on, being able to maintain that as well. So that's reflected in the modernization piece. Before we dive into the key moves, just wanted to give a, a very high level summary of what we've heard in the engagement process. A lot of the themes around affordability, um, investing in, uh, in communities that uh, haven't been invested in historically or as much. And of course, safety is uh, an ongoing and major, major concern. How do we think about uh, our spaces, our streets, and, and uh, being able to manage the reallocation of our right of way. Uh, right now, most of our right of way is dedicated to cars, about 70 to 80%, depending how you count it. Um, can we take slices of that in certain situations to help buses uh, move better, to help bikes uh, connect better to where uh, travelers need to go? And at the same time, uh, still keep freight moving. And for people who do need to drive, uh, being able to uh, allow them to keep uh, moving as well. Um, and like we said, maintenance is key. How do we keep uh, uh, enough funding available to maintain our streets? Um, and then on the theme again of sa safety, making sure that our bus stops are safe, our transit stations, uh, are safe. Again, a way to help folks uh, want to ride our transit system. Um, and then another uh, um, piece around safety and, and equity and making sure that uh, our transit is uh, affordable and, uh, and and accessible for BIPOC communities. So something you can take a look in more detail in, in the latter parts of the uh, 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 Part two, there uh, is a phase one and phase two summary, and it's available as well uh, on the website. The key moves. So uh, the key moves, we, we uh, tie them to uh, the six goals around safety, equity, sustainability, uh, mobility, livability, maintenance, modernization. I'm gonna, this is just very high level. I wanted you to see that there are some Key moves about two between four and five in each of them, and uh, I'll walk you through uh, some of them in each of these sections. So, leading with safety, uh, our goal is to prioritize safety for all travelers uh, in Seattle. Um, with uh, you know, our, our hope is to get to zero um, injuries and and uh, fatal crashes. So, one way is to reduce vehicle speed. Um, we're doing that on many of the arterial now. Uh, can we do a better job of that? And, and through uh, compliance and, and what are some of the ways that we, uh, we could do that? Maybe cameras, maybe other ways of enforcement, um, maybe even engineering uh, the streets a little bit better. Uh, concentrate safety investments at the most collision prone location. So we've got, uh, we know where the, uh, the high injury network is uh, located where the injuries are at. Let's take a look at those first and, and see how we might uh, be able to address the issues uh, in our uh, roadway system right now. Um, and of course, making all our journeys safer um, from, from home to where we need to go. Uh, and we can start by making sure our uh, routes to school, to parks, and to transit uh, are as safe as uh, can be. So 
So this is uh, speaking to the idea of, of you know, 15 minute uh, cities, 15 minute neighborhoods. And so working also with our partners at uh, the Office of Community Development, uh, Office of Planning Community Development on um, their plan and their growth strategy and incorporating uh, improved uh, growth management strategies along with our uh, transportation intervention. Um, around equity, transportation justice uh, is central. I'll read one of these is really it's about co-creating with community. So uh, staff being able to come out to the community and talk and, and continue to invite all of you to uh, co-create with us what the, how your community should evolve. Uh, for example, we're embarking on uh, work even to implement some of the things that we're already talking about here, uh, low pollution neighborhoods. Um, you can think of those as even low traffic neighborhoods. They, they, would, they might be different in different parts of the city. So being able to center your voices, center voices of communities of color, especially in underrepresented groups in, in the planning processes, going to communities rather than having them uh, come to us and, and also being part of the decision-making process. Uh, around climate action, this is uh, an important goal that we've heard a lot about from the community. How do we respond to uh, climate change through innovation and also through the lens of climate justice? Um, improving neighborhood quality is, is a big part of that and health outcomes that promote clean and sustainable travel options. Uh, so you squint your eye there, you can uh, see that uh, uh, in, in the more detail that we show in, in part two, we're talking about increased uh, walking, increased cycling, and increased uh, um, transit use and making sure all of the infrastructure for that uh, is improved as much as uh, we can within the limits of, of our funding. A greening city streets uh, through landscaping uh, and street trees to better handle climate change. Uh, before this, I was uh, at a meeting with the Soto BIA and, and they're making a push to uh, uh, recommend more street trees uh, in uh, Soto as, as a way to reduce the urban heat island effect uh, from all of uh, um, the concrete uh, that's in that part of town. So that's a way that we co-create with the community to see what are the ways to um, improve uh, their parts of the city that's right uh, for them. Okay, next one, connecting people and goods. Um, a lot of these seem like, no duh, we're gonna create seamless travel connections, make walking, biking, and rolling easy and enjoyable travel choices, uh, create world-class access to transit, make service more frequent and reliable. Uh, related to freight, we wanna enhance the uh, economic vitality by making a uh, freight move reliably and, and addressing the growth in e-commerce deliveries. And we'll do this as well by managing curb space uh, to reflect uh, the ways we are using and accessing uh, our curb. So some of that might include digital um, management of our curbs so trucks aren't circling around to find uh, a parking spot. In some cases also where it's more dense, maybe uh, e-cargo bikes might be the more appropriate way to get your uh, delivery. Uh, also thinking about uh, more efficient ways of, of maybe getting your package um, at our light rail stations. Maybe we'll have uh, common carrier lockers where UPS and Amazon can deliver the package there, you can make have that option. So when you're coming off the train, you pick up your uh, parcel, if it uh, can fit into a locker and then uh, you know walk it home. Um, that way we're not depending solely on vehicles to uh, make, uh, complete the first last mile end of uh, the journey of a uh, parcel. Streets are people, places we love. This is really the theme around livability. How can we reimagine our streets uh, as inviting places to, to linger uh, and to play, really to, to be and stay? Uh, our public rights of way aren't just for moving. Uh, we want to be able to make sure that uh, 
many of our places are great places just to be. So thinking about how we might reallocate space to prioritize people. Um, and while at the same time, making sure we, we are preserving access for goods, uh, um, for freight delivery and emergency response. So uh, we've got concepts around, like I said, low pollution neighborhoods or low traffic neighborhoods. Um, we've, we've heard from uh, the freight community, though, that we still need to get our trucks to the businesses, if that's what you are thinking of to do in commercial uh, areas. I think there's certainly a balance that can happen in many places around the world. There are walking districts where you can see uh, delivery trucks going no more than five miles per hour. Um, and it works. So I think uh, if we can have enough of that conversation with the community and with the businesses, we can certainly create uh, more uh, people prioritized uh, places and, and still uh, make the businesses uh, uh, embrace uh, that opportunity. Ideas around um, mobility hubs, so possibly making some of our uh, neighborhood commercial areas as ways to uh, be mobility hubs as well. So really thinking about uh, uh, transfers or if you're needing to make a transfer at, uh, uh, at one of these mobility hubs, being able to access different uh, mobility options or making it safe to access uh, another mode that uh, gets you to your final destination. Um, and then on last year is activating and maintaining public spaces, uh, public spaces to create welcoming and age-friendly public realm. Um, our city includes young people uh, and elderly people as well, but most of the time, a lot of our right of way is, is really for those who, who are able-bodied. Uh, we're being mindful of making uh, um, the right amount of investment in, in uh, improving our right of way to make sure that uh, young people are safe, uh, people with disabilities have access to the places that they need to go and that there are also public spaces that uh, uh, are welcoming to them. Usually you'll see this in parks uh, department, but we'll work with parks to, to make that happen. We'd like to see more Occidental squares, um, place remnant properties that we own, maybe convert them uh, into spaces that, uh, can be used uh, um, for lots of different uses. And then streets that work um, today and in the future, uh, this uh, concept around maintenance uh, and, and modernization. Yes, we need a lot of shiny new things as uh, you were all talking about in uh, your last conversation. We also need to maintain what we have and then also maintain the, all the new things that may uh, come on board. How do we figure out how do we pay for them? Um, and, and how do we transform and manage our streets? Uh, again, being mindful of safety and uh, more sustainable uh, travel options. And uh, the second one here, reducing neighborhood disparity in the quality of streets, uh, making sure that uh, we are spending our maintenance dollars in a way that upgrades uh, streets that have been neglected for, um, for quite a long time. Uh, in, in areas of the city that uh, may be considered uh, equity uh, area. Then also thinking about how we might prepare some of our streets for emerging uh, travel options. Uh, I heard you know, a lot of folks saying, well, we're gonna have more um, transportation network uh, uh, options. These are the Ubers and Lyft. Maybe there are automated versions of those. Maybe uh, instead of uh, um, having them roam all around right now, maybe we have a small network where we test them out first. So having that opportunity to um, create some of that policy, usually it's a, a state level and uh, cities are uh, not allowed to make that um, policy. Um, we're lucky enough that uh, we've been granted that opportunity to, to make policy around um, some of these new uh, and emerging technologies. I'll pause there real quick, uh, take a breath. Any thoughts real quick or shall I keep on going? Lots to cover, but 
I'll try to get through in another five minutes and then we can have conversation. All right, go ahead, Michael. Right, two, uh, two quick questions. Uh, the first one is, um, we got reports from, uh, from the leasing agent for Amazon's vans that Amazon does not manage its uh, distribution uh, network very well. Uh, they get as many as four vans in front of the same building within uh, minutes of each other. And so do you have any plan to work with companies such as Amazon? UPS seems to have this down pat. Amazon doesn't. Uh, so to work with Amazon and other companies like that to uh, reduce uh, duplication, right. duplication, quintuplication of uh, uh, vehicles, rolling stock, uh, where a single uh, van will do and not take up as much street space or cause as much congestion. Right. Thank you for that question. Certainly, that's something we would like to help manage uh, and reduce that duplication quintuplication. I've never heard that one before, but yeah, uh, it certainly makes sense to do that. Uh, our curb management team uh, is working on digitizing the curb and we get more, be able to capture more data and being able to see that. So on our end, being able to perhaps create policy where we're seeing that happen to create carrots and sticks, um, maybe fees if you're going over a certain time of of doing that because it doesn't make sense to do that it would encourage amazon and their partners their third party delivery partners to be more mindful of uh, their tracking system uh, in, in delivery uh, second question is uh, um, your rights away and and your street ends uh, and and remnants are really not enough to provide the open space or the, uh, the gathering space uh, for everybody that you're expecting. And I'm glad that you're talking about partnering with parks to help that out. But I'm parks is the acquisition budget that parks has got to buy new land is pretty uh, tight. So as part of your working with parks, is there a way that you can you can mutually work to boost the acquisition money available to um, add to what you've got and combine it with uh, what they've got. Right. I, I think we're going to work in first with the property that SDOT owns and then where it makes sense to partner with parks, uh, given the opportunities that they have, we'll do that as well. We want to throw everything at the wall and see what will stick, literally. And there are some streets that already make sense to uh, turn into low traffic uh, uh, streets. Uh, there are some streets that within residential neighborhoods, such low uh, volume that why don't we just, you know, you can create the space within these streets by, uh, for example, in, in some parts of the city, and I see this uh, right by the where the proposed Delridge station is at near Andover, there is a raised, raised crosswalk, right? And that can help just frame the, the street space that this isn't a, a through street. Yes, it's still a through street. You, if you live there, you can go over the raised crosswalk, get to your house, and then maybe uh, exit out another part of the neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. But to others, it's not a place to go in and just sort of cut through the neighborhood. So those are ways to uh, reclaim space at, at a lower cost. So really building off of what we've learned from the home zone process when the West Seattle Bridge was closed, and then working with community members to, to see what is appropriate for them. In Lake City, they proposed you know, uh, let's just paint on the street for now and create a, a space for the neighborhood that was on a healthy street um, or, or designated healthy street. So how, uh, uh, how these spaces and streets are reclaimed uh, may be di different in, in different parts uh, of the city, but we wanna have that conversation with community members and, 
And in certain situations, it may, you know, take uh, some acquisition or even capital proposing capital projects to, to deliver on that. Um, more really making it more of uh, investment in reclaiming uh, street space. But we're thinking there's certainly a number of opportunities within the right of way that SDOT already owns uh, that we could convert into, I would say, opening the streets to people uh, and, and prioritizing them more and reducing the priority for vehicles on those streets. Yeah, I, I really appreciate SDOT uh, putting in the curb ramps, putting in uh, little islands to make uh, the crosswalks shorter. I, one idea is also while you're doing that, add a tree next to it too, so right. that uh, when people are waiting to cross the street, uh, they can, uh, they are protected from the sun and it just becomes a, a nice little way to increase the number of trees we have in our city. Right, right. It's exactly what we heard at the, the Soto session I was just at earlier today. Thank you for that. All right. Any any other comments, or I can continue, and then we can go back to uh, discussion. All right. So yeah. in this in this first part, then you've also just got a summary of um, sort of the key moves from each of the the uh, modes. Uh, we we've got transit, of course, the, the typical that we look at from transit to cycling, freight, and urban goods. Uh, pedestrian, uh, and then we have added four more that we're looking at. Uh, so people, street, and public spaces. So this is sort of a, a newer element. And as a picture there suggests, how do we use some spaces that SDOT already owns and manage them better so that uh, they're more welcoming uh, for people, not necessarily to move through, but to stay? Uh, so really uh, uh, making that uh, space much better and also reclaiming some uh, spaces in the, in the right of way that are just still very wide. We don't need as wide of a space in some places uh, for, for vehicles. And there's that comment there about greening as well, um, uh, just as Martin had said. Okay, and then we've got new and emerging mobility. So this is uh, how do we uh, continue to evolve with uh, e-bikes, e-scooters, um, all the other things that may be uh, coming. We wanna be mindful of how these uh, are a value add to the community and, 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 and not a, uh, something that detracts from our um, uh, mobility. And then the curbside management, as I mentioned, uh, being uh, more mindful of how we use the space and, and um, being able to understand how it's being used better and, and managing it better through digitization, being uh, you can uh, reserve a parking spot in front of a building. And then uh, the comment that we heard of like, you know, minimizing the number of uh, trucks from one company delivering uh, into one space. So being able to, uh, partner with companies and use data to uh, make more efficient use of that limited um, uh, resource at the curb. Uh, and then, you know, to some people might be surprised, we also have a vehicle element. Um, we want to also recognize people are still going to drive cars. Uh, maybe they will be more uh, EVs in the future. That's something that uh, we're also uh, pushing for, uh, but as we continue to drive cars, we want to make sure that uh, it's safe for all people, not just the people who uh, are driving uh, vehicles. And then rebalancing street space uh, to really think about how other uh, essential functions within the right of way can uh, operate better. Uh, so thinking about streets, multi-lane streets or arterials, uh, asking the question, might they, do they need all that space? In, certain, in some situations, uh, maybe yes, that we leave it alone. In some situations, 
maybe not. We think about how we might uh, either improve the sidewalk, uh, reclaim some of the uh, space that's used for cars now and turn them into transit lanes or uh, better bike lanes. Uh, another way to uh, improve or maximize the use of, of our right of way is through freight uh, and, and uh, what we're calling freight and bus lanes. So in some places where we've got uh, plans for dedicated transit lanes, could there be opportunities for freight to share them uh, at certain times of the day, maybe call it also 24 seven, but uh, knowing, making sure that freight isn't uh, impacting the transit service uh, in that uh, transit uh, only lane. And then of course, making sure we're, we're uh, not harming um, uh, emer our emergency response and uh, critical access needs to um, places that uh, uh, responders need to go to and where sort of our, all of our critical access needs from uh, uh, trash removal, et cetera, need to access. Um, the last uh, couple of bits of, of the first of phase one uh, has an implementation strategy. Uh, these aren't fully fleshed out yet. Uh, uh, in, in, as we hear back from the community, we'll uh, get more details on projects and program identif identification. So there's a project list that will be coming out shortly. We're working on that. And then also potential funding opportunities. This is where we welcome your comments of how might we pay for all of these things? There's some things that we know that are pretty reliable. And then of course we have a levy every uh, eight to you know, 10 years. Um, how do we improve on all of that? Um, and then of course, some other things that um, we might do, charge for parking, charge for how we might uh, use the road in certain places. So many different ways to, to fund this and uh, that's an ongoing uh, conversation. Same as the prioritization framework, we wanna do this with the community, have that conversation of how do we prioritize all of these new things, new shiny things that uh, many in the community have said we want. And then performance targets, uh, still a work in progress. I know a lot of people are saying, hey, we, we need a vehicle miles traveled uh, target, reduction target, uh, certainly something that we're working on. Um, we're wanting to use uh, new uh, and available data uh, around that. So uh, working with the state and making sure that we get that right. They're gonna be providing guidance later this year. Uh, we may be ahead of them. So we may have a target, they'll provide the guidance and then we may adjust it. So by the final, uh, we should have at least a VMT reduction target uh, that's ready. All right, the, the next part, very hefty section. I'll just say it's in eight parts. Um, please go to the website uh, I showed earlier to go look at them in more detail. You've got transit, bike, uh, and freight, and urban goods, the pedestrian, the typical four that we've done in the future, uh, in the past, I meant, and then uh, moving forward, we've got people, streets, and public spaces, new emerging mobility, curbside management, and vehicle. And again, here is the, the site. I can give you a sneak peek if you uh, haven't seen it yet. Uh, do we want to go there? Or do you want to jump into conversation? How about we just, I'll keep going and then we can just jump into conversation. I'd love to hear what you all uh, have to say. So submit okay. your comments uh, by October 23rd. We'll take your comments, be working through uh, October, the end of October, November, December to get to a final plan, hopefully in mid-January. and. Um, have this embraced by the mayor's office and then the mayor, it, it'll ultimately be uh, described as the mayor's transportation plan that would be proposed to city council for um, approval. And I think that's where I'm at. I think we still have a little time to, to have conversation. Um, I know you all have been meeting for a long time already, so. Um, oh, one last plug, the, the, the comp plan is coming out. It will come out in a few weeks. I know they they said it'll be coming and coming, but there's been a lot of uh, internal uh, review that has needed to be resolved. So it's, it's imminent. With that, thank you. Um, look forward to having conversation with you um, and sharing your thoughts. Oh, my daughter wants to join us. She loves <laughs> these meetings. 
All right. It looks like Michael's okay. computer has gone kaput. So oh no, we will just be doing this through my computer. So um, anyhow, does anybody over here have questions at this point? <laughs> Uh, oh, hi. Look at that. <laughs> I have mobile cam. Uh, are you considering roundabouts more? King County is using them very successfully now uh, at the intersections. And uh, it, for the initial investment, is relatively high, but long term uh, maintenance cost is very low. And you can replace uh, tons of traffic lights and also move traffic better than uh, stopping and going. So where, where are you with That is a great comment um, that I would love to receive and share. I say exactly the same thing to my engineers. And I, I think there's a cultural shift that's happening in uh, our department. And so we're having conversation about it for sure. Um, but it's, it's taking some time to, I would say, have it be more welcomed. We do have these, the tiny little traffic circles within neighborhoods, right? And I, I've been pushing, how might we do that more uh, within the arterials in these particular locations? I, I see them all the time. It's like, oh my gosh, this is where uh, uh, a roundabout could work. You're replacing all of these uh, uh, traffic signals. Um, but I think we, we internally, just the sort of mechanism at S dot. Um, there needs to be some, I think, piloting and trial and error on uh, on our part uh, for that to to happen. Because I think the culture right now is still not supportive or embracing of roundabouts. They're they're definitely a group of folks who propose it as as a a, a safety opportunity. Um, we put it on maps and often the modeling says, oh, it doesn't work. But I'm, I'm always oh, one to say, well, modeling isn't always the best way to, to, to make a decision on, on roundabouts. I'm a traffic engineer. I've designed a number of roundabouts. The right-of-way acquisition for those is brutal. It requires a right. lot, lot of right-of-way right acquisition to do those. So you, right. know, you gotta do a cost benefit that's worth it. Right, but there, there's plenty of spaces within Seattle where we do have that uh, space that we would own, and um, and I think that's where we might try maybe piloting some of those just to say you know this this could work, and and where we have the space uh, uh, try to do that. Yeah, I was surprised. Uh, a few years ago, there was a plan to put put a roundabout on the south end of Green Lake. And instead, this very complicated intersection was built. That's an understatement. Uh, yes, yeah. it's an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been a whole lot easier with a roundabout. Yeah, yeah and, and I think that's the ethos that we're trying to do is sometimes simpler is a lot better. Yeah. yeah. So one last question about uh, carbon. Uh, for years, we've been trying to get the start to do a carbon footprint beyond just traffic, the 2020 traffic right. carbon analysis uh, showed that uh, uh, the vehicle vehicle load uh, up to was about 1.9 million tons of carbon a, a year, but ESTA simply doesn't track the, uh, the effect of its road designs, its signal designs uh, on the carbon footprint and they don't also track the construction uh, carbon footprint that they create, which is uh, massive. And then on top of that, they're they're not tracking the sound transit carbon footprint that's uh, helping prevent the city from reaching its carbon neutrality goals. So, uh, are we serious about carbon footprint and climate change, or are we not? And how does SDOT regard that? Uh, we we do have, a, I would say, a climate interdepartmental team, and there are certainly a group of folks within that team who have pushed for us to um, look at the impacts of of carbon in in our um, uh, in our materials. So essentially, measuring embedded carbon, and again, that's something that's 
a cultural shift uh, within our, our department and leadership. And that's something that uh, we're continuing to push to say, it's not just about tailpipe emissions, but it's also in our construction materials. There's certainly a group that's much more knowledgeable about it than I am, and, and they have uh, recommended it. And that's something that we continue to push to say, it needs to be an overall accounting of, of our emissions and not just uh, at, the tail, at the tailpipe. I mean, the draft right now says, oh, it's negligible. We don't we don't have to worry about it because I uh, laws are getting uh, forcing us to be better citizen essentially, and so it will disappear. But when you look at the West Seattle light rail extension, it says it's going to generate six hundred fourteen thousand tons. Yeah, if we only if the whole city is only using 1.9 million a year, then that's a big number. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. inaccurate. Right. All right, another question. Hi, uh, yeah, I have a, a question kind of around um, the speed of execution uh, for SDOT. So um, as I was reading the plan, I kind of noticed, at least when I was just looking at some of the bike improvements around West Seattle, that it'll be kind of designed and considered in conjunction with light rail construction. Um, and that will be many years in the future. So I'm wondering what SDOT can do in the time before that to move at a quicker pace or give us some more interim solutions um, kind of in that direction. That's a, a great question and something that we struggle with uh, at SDOT. We want to do a lot of things fast, and then we go essentially to uh, our finance folks who who hold the purse strings to a lot of things, and they're like, what are you talking about? You don't have the money to do that. And we're like, well, here are ways to maybe pay for them. Um, so I think it becomes now what are revenue generating opportunities so that we can accelerate uh, the, the construction of bike lanes, uh, lower polluting infrastructure. Um, so that's a conversation I think that's going to continue. Um, I'm being recorded here, I'm just gonna say it. Congestion pricing is something that uh, could help possibly, but I think that's a politically fraught uh, topic right now. And if there are ways that we can, I don't know, in price parking, price of the usage of cars, it, it can do both to reduce our VMT, generate income, and also pay for a lot of um, new and shiny things that would be, a, a, to me, a, a virtuous cycle, uh, literally. And that's something that we have to do a better job of selling to, um, our politicians and to say, hey, let's let's go forth and try. There are some politicians that are uh, outside of, of Seattle that are pushing. Uh, and so I think the conversation is will come, especially when we uh, look at the fiscal cliff of, of transportation when uh, gas tax revenues continue to, to decline. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I want to keep us moving. Um because we still have one more guest on our agenda and a couple of things to talk about. Um, big, uh, big thanks to Radcliffe uh, while he's been in, involved in this work for quite some time. Um, it, it may surprise you to know that he was not the planned person to be attending this evening from SDOT. So along with all of the other things that have been going on with us this week, he had to step in very quickly today. So we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Happy to come back. We'll anytime. let you get back and, uh, to your daughter and yeah. your family and all, all right. that sort of stuff. Have a Thank good evening. Have, have a, a good great evening. evening, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. I have no idea why the Wi-Fi dropped out on me, but not other things. Um, this is a. Uh, this is why we. Uh, this is why we make co-hosts during meetings. Um, all right. Uh, very quickly here. Um, uh, what do we have? Um, so
So I want to mention if people for some reason are not aware, um, the uh, the Spokane Street Swing Bridge will be closing for an entire week. So people driving, walking, and biking in that direction, um, if they have not heard elsewhere, um, they are it's a, it's they're they're replacing another one of the large drums to try and prevent uh, get everything upgraded. It's it's nice when we do maintenance on bridges. Um, so folks who've been wondering why they keep breaking down and getting stuck in various uh, positions down there, this is part of that process to get everything updated. Uh, if you want more information, um, uh, there's a great uh, blog post on the SDOT blog. Um, I did sort of a short URL there, um, but you can also just look up. It was just posted on the 25th. Um, and then uh, we have our second uh, District 1 City Council candidate joining us this evening, Rob Saka. Um, you can uh, find out more about him and his campaign at voterobsaka.com, which is up there on the screen. Um, and we will, uh, he is with us here. Um, I'm going to ask him to kind of move over here so maybe I can get him um, a little closer up on the camera. Um, uh, right there. And, uh, and yeah, I will uh, pull down the slides here again and um, give us an opportunity to uh, to chat. Um, so, uh, you know, Rob, it's a, it's an open conversation like we talked like we told you. Um, Marin was here earlier. Um, we were talking about things like transportation impact fees, development, you know, all like any issue is up there. So if you want to take a few minutes to introduce yourself and share your priorities, and then we can just chat a little bit about, you know, if you have questions for us or we have questions for you. kind of dialogue rather than me kind of professing and, and also hear it, you know from you all as many hear your ideas and, and thoughts and take any of course questions you might have as well um but i'll just say this it's great to it's great to be in this space thank you larry thank you uh to this organization for allowing me to to be with you all um and it's great to see some familiar faces i'm starting to to, to see some familiar faces and different groups and it's it's like a full circle moment for me. We're all connected in so many different profound ways. Uh, and I had a, I, I attended a fundraiser last night with a gentleman that I attended. He's part of this organization. It's an off-leash dog park like coalition and uh, met with them. And he attended another function last night that I attended and never thought, but yeah, look, we're all connected. And we're in, in so many ways and transportation is the heart of it. That's how we get together and gather. So um, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I, I will profess right now, I'm a little, uh, this is the last of three, I think three full community meetings that I've had. Um, and on top of two media interviews, on top of two hours of door knocking, there's many communities in our city that need sidewalks. I'll be honest, I've, I've walked them firsthand. Uh, and um, and I did thank you for allowing me to come a little late. I was at a, an event earlier the, downtown with the mayor uh, and some other folks. But anyways, I'm going to shut up. Thank you. Uh, curious to hear any comments, questions, feedback from you all. I'll, I'll just let you know. Um, because there are lots of events, so we do record our meetings. Um, and we are going out live to Facebook, our Facebook page right now. Awesome. Um, so 
there may be people who come in, like we have the board members who are at other events, so they may be coming back and watching afterwards. Just be aware you're being recorded. Awesome. Um, yeah. But it's open to, well, again, I guess I'll ask the board members in the room if you have any questions first, but otherwise, anyone just it's an open up. I'll go ahead and ask. Um, uh, we've been as a board discussing traffic impact fees lately, um, and we want some issues being discussed uh, with the city. I just think we'd like to hear thoughts, uh, obviously, both sides of that. Um, I'm very contentious. So yeah. What's your thoughts on it? So, and, and, and I, will, I will be honest, I'm not fully up to speed on traffic impact fees. So, if you can, I, I think I understand at a very high level. So, just to level set, can you help me understand, like, what they are in, in your view on them? Sure. Um, I, I dealt with them a lot more in California. I think Michael might be able to speak more as far as what they're looking at in terms of Seattle specific. <laughs> um, let's see. I, know I, I, I think what I would say, I would just do sort of really general and say, you know, there, there are a number of cities from cities the size of you know, Burien and Sammamish to Bellevue and Kirkland, uh, North, East, South, Washington State. So not an unusual thing in Washington State. It's actually unusual in Washington that Seattle doesn't have them. And essentially, it's a fee on new development that tries to assess if this development is built, um, what are the going to be the traffic impacts? And then how do we charge the development to help pay for the investment the city will need to make to mitigate those impacts. That's that's yeah, the I'll, I'll, that's the really base definition yeah, of what yeah, should be happening. I'll do a big picture because again, yeah. my specialty is uh, I, I haven't done a lot of traffic engineering work here. My specialty right. in California, so my special is always looking at these mm -hmm. brand new about how much traffic is going to put out, and then making sure they're paying for the impacts. How are they going to be uh, creating a significant impact? Taking something from an acceptable level as opposed to unacceptable and then putting a price on that and then working with those businesses, et cetera, to fully pay for the impacts, because that's not being done right now. Yeah. We're just kind of building and nobody is putting any money towards um, the problems they're creating, the rest of the bridge or city streets, et cetera. So we're just kind of, there's some bits of discussion, maybe we need some new ways to raise revenue and actually have businesses creating these impact to pay their fair share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so great, great question. I obviously, since I asked what what they are more or less, I don't have a firm like concrete, you know, like position on it just yet. But based off of what you what you shared, and and you know, I'm going to restate just so we're all on the same page. And you know, please correct my understanding of this. But high level, it's a it's a it's a fee imposed on the developer and any new development that you know, like you know like whatever whatever is being built. Um, whatever the impact, the likely impact of that is, it's an assessment fee imposed on the developer uh, to mitigate some of the, the kind of traffic costs. And, and that can go towards potentially like more sidewalks, street, like traffic signals or transit infrastructure. I don't know, like my guess, right? I don't know. Yeah, those, yeah street widenings, which is always the last resort. Yep. Obviously, traffic control, traffic signals is one of the big things that you're actually taking something to have an acceptable level of service for me that was in the best kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, there's all kinds of remedies. There's also all kinds of things that you can work with businesses to help them mitigate that they can their band pools, et cetera. There's all kinds of things that large businesses can do. And we see some of that stuff around the city that they're doing to help minimize their own time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So and then I think I would just add um two two of the key elements that are in the debate right now. Um a lot of developers have come forward to argue that the, adding that additional cost, um, some are saying that they would not be able to pencil out projects or they might shrink the size of projects. Um, and then there are a lot of folks that I guess we would typically put in the in the quote urbanist um, camp who say that, you know, like several fees, like why would we add more fees onto housing, that's gonna mean we build less housing or it's gonna make it more expensive um, for people to get into housing. And yeah. so those are two key arguments that are in the debate right now. So, 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 and they're kind of related, it sounds like. They're, well, they're on the same side of the issue uh, and uh, opposed to them, sounds like. Um, so I, I, would, I would have to 
really dig in and study the issue further to, to be able to say definitively one way or the other, worth exploring at a minimum. Um, I am sensitive, <clears throat> excuse me, I am sensitive, both of those arguments, and uh, like from the developer that on the one hand, maybe it's gonna be an additional layer, of, of, uh, an additional burden or onerous thing for the developer. And maybe, I don't know, like I'm just thinking out loud here more than anything, but like one of my, part of my goal is to help streamline and improve the permitting process and to make it less onerous and less burdensome. So like, maybe if we do that, like maybe it'll kind of offset and, 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 you know, that might make sense in certain circumstances. Maybe we'll, maybe we won't, I don't know, worth exploring. Um, and on, on the urbanist front, I've been meeting with a lot of folks. Uh, I don't turn down meetings. I meet with people like all the time, pro, both proactively and reactively. Although with six weeks left in the campaign trail, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I might have to be more disciplined and put some more rigor around that because uh, there's only a certain amount of time. But, um, but I, I met with a lot of quote unquote urbanists, including like Yimby folks and, and, and you know, what, like, uh, and I hear same, the same arguments um, and how, how that can actually have a counterproductive impact on growth and development that we, that I personally think we need. Uh, so I'd be curious to long went away me saying like, I don't know enough yet, but that's, I want, I, I walk through my analysis and I want you to understand how I ask questions. Cause that's important because I, I don't purport to know, nor anyone, any one candidate not in this race or any across the city should purport to be the expert in any one thing. But I want, you should understand how I think and how I go about problem solving things. Cause who knows what the heck's going to come up before council tomorrow? So, another form of uh, concurrent development we have to be uh, we put some concurrent development in uh, seven years ago, eight years ago. Um, so, but how are you paying for the concurrent development? Um, yeah, uh, I think so. If I'm following, this is the um, you know one one of the goals. Uh, one of the goals that we have, you know, for our organization is really that we want to see government investment and in, in infrastructure follow with growth. That in some ways that's how a bunch of neighborhood-based people um, got involved in things, is because we were a lot of us were involved 20, almost 25 years ago now, in neighborhood plans that were happening and what neighborhoods want. And we were told, you know, accept more growth, create urban villages like the junction here, you know, take hundreds more units, you know, update it with the times. And we will invest in transportation. We will invest in, you know, better electrical hookups, better, you know, you name it. And we find ourselves now 15, 20 years later where we're like, okay, we got all the units. Mm. We got all the increased people and then sometimes cars and pollution and other things. Mm. And we're not seeing more trees we're not seeing more you know grocery stores we're yeah. not seeing more Ooh. all those things that you need and so it's great to say that uh, we want to become a dense city that's welcoming and affordable but like if we bring people in and then they can't get to their job because there's not a bus line near them like that's not helping people that's actually harming them more so. you get it in your power place which in our neighborhoods happened 12 times since we moved in. Yeah. Um, it happened to me yesterday morning, by the way, in Yep. Yep. Yeah, right. So you don't get the bigger pipes for the, the wastewater and the inland. We don't get the bigger cables for power uh, or we get bigger buildings that uh, suck more of these folks. Yep. So the kind of the uh, <clears throat> scrapping impact fee is, is really a single focus of what was concurrent development, which was everything should be paid for in, in the development. And the developers have tried to lose about, oh, we can't make money on this. Give me part of the candidates, part of the council members' job is to say, fine, then don't. We'll find somebody else who can make money on it, but I'm sure somewhere on earth, probably across Lake Washington and Bellevue, where they already pay in back fees, somebody can come here and make a profit. So if you don't want to make a profit, that's up to you. Uh, that's to me. That's that's what the council member's job. Yeah, part of the council member's job. You're right. Like it, it's it's like to have an innate understanding of what is market 
And if it's market, if it's truly market in most jurisdictions, then it's certainly on the table. It's even stronger an argument to, to, to do something and enact something similar here in, in Washington. Um, uh, but but a couple, couple like thoughts here because you know some some really good things said for both both you guys. But um, look, that's the essence of my camp. What you just said. Look, I'm here to I'm here to champion a a a more thoughtful, balanced approach to insert your issue. Transportation, yes. Growth, yes. Like so on growth, it, like that is one area. It sounds like me and my opponent agree, kind of mostly on the need to kind of um, you know add growth and at a high level, add growth and, and density. You know, like for example, I support uh, a a a plan that kind of sets forth how we grow. As you guys know, the comp plan, I'm not, yeah, I'm speaking to probably uh, audiences that know exactly what the hell I'm talking about, but I support alternative five. I'm inclined, strongly inclined to support that one. My opponent is, sounds like strongly inclined to support uh, a mythical, not yet existing um, option six. And, uh, but both are very big, bold and ambitious. And, but my only thing is we need to be super thoughtful Yes, we're gonna like I I plan if elected I plan to help grow and and add density and 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 make sure we have a lot of food deserts in in this in this district we have at least three that I know of I live in one Delbridge um, with Georgetown South Park uh, and probably more if I got to thinking like oh where did I knock doors and what, where's the last door but uh, but in any event as we grow. We need to make sure we have supporting infrastructure in place to, to accommodate that growth and development. So if we keep adding on more units, for example, on Dell Ridge, without a thoughtful analysis about, okay, where are these people going to buy their food? It's already a food desert. So you want to, my, my neighborhood grocery store, guys, is three and a half miles south on Dell Ridge. Three and a half miles. It's a food desert. Um, and that's probably, it's probably the closest to get rather than that and cut up Genesee and the go up the like. So as we grow, we need to be thoughtful about making sure we have supporting infrastructure in place to accommodate that growth. And, uh, and again, I'm here to focus on, well, one thing I didn't mention, I'm here, like part of my plan, I mentioned those three things, public safety, uh, action on homelessness, and then affordability, but intersecting all those things. <clears throat> I'm here to focus on the basics of what I think a well-functioning city government can and should be delivering for people. I call it the three P's. I like alliteration, three P's. Uh, <clears throat> public safety, public parks, public infrastructure, public works, if you will. So it's like potholes. I literally, guys, I literally want to be the king of potholes. That's it. Uh, but 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 I, I <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm only... Might... What, what's that? It's the mayor of my arm wrestling. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, I know. Well, at least in this district, at least in West Seattle, and you know, District One. But so, yeah, that's that's my whole point. We need to be thoughtful, and I know it's not thoughtful if we keep adding more density solely in in Delridge, and like nobody thought about it because we have a great option. We have a a co op right now. It's a great option, but it's not a truly equitable one for people that. Because it limited hours, un, like inconsistent hours, it's 100% volunteer run, right? And so, who does that leave out? Well, it leaves out people, uh, you know, who have un, inconsistent, unpredictable, unreliable schedules, part-time gig workers, you know, like grocery store workers. Like, so, anyways, we just need to be thoughtful uh, on on how we grow. Well, and talking about infrastructure and and and. Um, some of the stuff you were just talking about with the food desert, because I'm also down in uh, North Dartmouth. Um, you know, some of us we were we were involved in those discussions um, years ago, um, and we, in some cases, really me. Um, but uh, the reason that the Route 50 is running through the northern part of Delridge is because we lobbied and fought for it. The reason that the Route 120 on Kinks over to Westwood Village was because we said we have people who need to be able to get to grocery stores with strollers and in wheelchairs, and there's we need buses to get them there. And it turned back to infrastructure. Um, one of the things that came up with the 50 was essentially Metro said, well, in order to do this bus, like we have to do all these things, and we need to have there used to be no, no stoplight at the top of Genesee. 
And they said, we, we feel the only way to adequately run that is we need to stop like that. And I was like, okay, well, that's like hard. And there's like wait lists for such things or whatever. And so then I went back, to the, uh, went to SDOT and said, what do we need to do to get this? Well, you know, you got to get on a wait list. It could be years, et cetera. And so a couple of us got together and we essentially just ping pong back and forth. We started going, to, you know, and fibbing a little bit, but it worked. We went to Metro and we said, you know, SDOT is, is, is willing to build this street light and hop us ahead. If you promise that you will commit your budget and run this new bus line through here, and then we go to SDOT, Metro is ready to spend <laughs> money right now in their budget for next year, the new bus line, but they say they absolutely can't do it unless you build the street line. And we just went back and forth between them until we could get them to sign in agreements and say, okay, we're going to do that so you can do this and so it can benefit the neighborhood. Um, and so that's the kind of stuff that we, you know, we're, we're wonky about these things, but we get involved in that because we want to serve our neighborhoods and our communities here in West Seattle. Love it. Yeah. And and I aspire to be the best advocate and ally I can be in, in, in the cause. And, um, you know, whatever the issue is, beyond any kind of commitments I've already made on the campaign trail, May, May tonight, um, I can't commit to any one thing if elected. I can't commit to uh, being the champion or advocate of, of, of like helping to pass and make sure I vote, reliable vote, yes or no, or whatever whatever the issue is from you or insert your, your group who has an interest in whatever outcome of, you know, whatever topic that might appear before Seattle City Hall. But my, I can't commit to this. This is easy. Um, I, I can't commit to doing the work getting up to speed, listening, learning, hearing from you all on uh, 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 what you want and being the best advocate I can be. And some, sometimes that means like going to bat and saying yes and doing like, sometimes it's, it's, it's a conversation about why not now, uh, but listening, learning, being responsive, being responsive, something I think government needs now more than ever. Not here to put anyone under, throw anyone under the bus, but I like, I, I think that is the sign of an effective, a huge sign of an effective council member, responsive to all, all. So. Uh, quick question about uh, Father Curry, Doc. Would you uh, abide by the previous city council's uh, uh, agreements to resist expanding the dock, but uh, going along with? Seismic retrofit and extending the dock and uh, raising the dock for uh, climate change um, tide drives. Yeah, uh, were you at the meeting? Did I I I, I yeah. met with the Fauntleroy uh, folks. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> and le learn learn a little bit about the issues and the history there. Um, and uh, and I I still I still do need to to get more up to speed on that. Uh, but what I said then, I'll, I'll reemphasize here. I know there is overlapping interests between the state, what the state wants to do, what the county may or may not want to do, but there's definitely over interest and in, overlapping interests and sometimes, sometimes tension between the city and the state on these issues. I don't, I don't represent, I, I'm not running to represent what they want in Bashan. I'm not running to represent any other kind of state interests. I, I represent neighborhood people in Fauntleroy and you all. So, so, so I'm, I'm, I, so, so that is, that is my, that is my commitment. I'm here to do what you all want me to do, not what they want someone to do in Seattle City Council and Bashan. I appreciate the feedback, but I answered you all. I serve you all. Uh, and, and so without like recalling exact word for word of, of that, what the prior city council, um, you know, committed to. One, I'm not here to undo any prior work. So that's why when I like, my opponent supports this mythical thing that like doesn't even exist. So in, in effect, that would be undoing prior work and creating a new bureau to, to bring that to life if that's the direction. I'm not here to undo prior work. Um, and, and, and second guess any, like, if it's already been agreed to and committed, then I'm inclined to just Keep keep that forward and making it better and working with you all to do that. Um, Rob, let me ask a big picture question. Here. Yeah, um, I've been a traffic engineer for about uh, thirty five years now, 
the industry has changed dramatically. We're starting to get smart cars, um, cars that will be um, drivers, et cetera. So in we're Seattle, we're a very high tech or oriented industry. So um, a lot of times we're designing for the past. We're kind of, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, design elements and roadways and stuff for craft, traffic. Well, I think if we, any of us look in the future, 30, 40, 50 years, it's probably going to be vastly different. So it's just kind of a big picture thing. Kind of what's your thought of being on the city council to make sure we're not designing roadways and transportation systems for the past, but really looking forward and trying to be at the leading edge of some of the new technologies and new ways to commute, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so my my vision for that is, is you said 40 years? Yeah, 40, 50 years. Okay, yeah, yeah. My, my vision for that is pretty simple. So I'm here to design friendly amendment to what you said. Um, yes, not looking back towards the past and, and designing, making sure, you know, whatever's we design is not based off of what exists in the past, but we do need to have an eye on, on what exists today. And then looking forward and being big, bold and transformative about how we, uh, you know, go about achieving that 30, 40, 50 year vision. Um, and in 40, 30, 40, 50 years, I, I hope as many people, I want to create a Seattle that <clears throat> we, we actually do have 15 minute walkable neighborhoods everywhere in the city. We actually do. But you live in North Del Ridge. That's a pipe dream for us mm -hmm. right now because it's a food that we just, I just got done explaining that's a food desert. So, um, so yeah, we need to make sure. So part of that is building out su supporting infrastructure as we build and grow. Another part of that is we need to get as many people out of single occupancy vehicles as possible. S simply put, because that's where the future is. That's where, uh, well, one, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> like different from an environmental uh, Im impact standpoint, as the number one contributor to greenhouse gas, 60% or something of, uh, like is, is, is that. So we need to get as many people out of that as possible and into uh, you know, more expanding our transit options for, for folks. Um, hopefully, and one of the things that I want to do is expand and build out infrastructure for like EV charging stations across the city, make it easier for people who do have that. Uh, and as that becomes, that technology becomes more affordable for the sort of masses, if you will, uh, making sure we have more options and infrastructure in place for people to charge it. Um, but I'm here to look forward and also be mindful of, of you know, things that exist today, re realities that exist today. <clears throat> that doesn't mean I'm beholden to what's going on today, uh, but we need to be thoughtful, thoughtful, I guess. And, and one huge area need, I'll just say, like, shameless plug. Might not win a bunch of votes on this right here, but it's the truth, guys. Um, I walked uh, maybe 10,000 doors. I, I personally personally knocked on my campaign. Double double that. 2X maybe. 2.5X that. Uh, there is a gross need for sidewalks, sidewalk infrastructure in this, in this city, in this district. I, I have never, it's, it's, it's glaringly, it's patently obvious to me from, from Arbor Heights to Del Ridge, particularly areas east of Del Ridge, um, South Park, it, it, it's, it's not super sexy, but it's, it's a critical need that I see right now more than ever. And I think Council Member Morales, if I understand correctly, last week or this earlier this week, uh, proposed a bill to, to, uh, to impart, divert some funds to like address that gap. And, I, and, and I'm <clears throat> strongly inclined to support that if I win. Because it, it, it's a critical need to, to help drive mobility and, um, and ex accessibility as well for people with you know, differently able folks. So right. I want to, we're, we're, we're getting past 8.30, which is when we normally adjourn. And I want to respect, uh, uh, respect the candidates time. Um, I will, so give a big sort of round of applause there to Rob Sutton. <laughs> Want to make sure to call attention again. Um, his campaign website, if you're looking for more information, is voterobsaka.com. Uh, R O B S A K A. Um, and uh, 
I will ask board members to indulge me for an extra five minutes and to hang around a little bit because we have a little bit of board business we have to do. Um, but if other folks want to head along, um, feel free. All right. So, if, if guests want to step, if guests want to step out of the room, um, and uh, board, uh, we got a couple of things real quick. Um, so. Uh, I've got I've got three bullet points. One is really for the record, so I'll do the last one first, um, which is that uh, the board decided to main position decided to maintain positions for the moment as is. So I'm continuing as chair. Um, Kate is vice chair. No, John is vice chair. John is vice chair. Kate is secretary, and Larry is treasurer. Um, so two items there. One, um, uh, as I keep bringing up, we're in the first full year of our bi-monthly meeting schedule. So our next meeting will be in November, um, but folks who've been around for a long time will know that that fourth Thursday would be Thanksgiving. So we usually vote to move to the third to Thursday. Um, so we would move to November 16th. So I would make a motion to move our regular meeting date to November 16th. Is there a second? Hey, Michael. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Michael. You opposed? Michael. And I don't see any comments from John. Michael. Um, and then. Um, Michael. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to say that on account of the fact that there is actually a, uh, a fifth, it's a month with a fifth. Oh. Thursday, that maybe that's a better option because then we wouldn't be conflicting with any because nobody yeah. meets on the fifth day of the month, and so we wouldn't run up against any uh, conflicts with anybody else. Mm -hmm. Oh, I I like that idea a lot. Um, shall, um, yeah. Um, shall, shall we amend our thing there to go to the the fifth Thursday then? That would be the thirtieth. Uh, so that would go to the 30th then, It'd be the fifth oh. Thursday. Um, all right, so let's amend that. Um, I, I move that we hold our November meeting on the fifth Thursday of this year, November 30th. Um, um, well, I don't know. Um, all those in favor say aye. Um, any opposed? Um, I will double check. We currently have one guest actually already booked for November, believe it or not. But as I mentioned earlier, um, that that uh, report out on um, on uh, the West Marginal Way bike lane. Um, my guess is they'll be fine with that, but I'll have to make sure to reach out to them. Um, so the other item I have here, um, it's sort of under old, old business um, because we had hybrid meetings under old business. So yay, we finally held a hybrid meeting despite all these crazy tech issues, <laughs> the recording seems to still be happening and we're working, so that's good. Um, uh, but because we are at the senior center, um, Larry, who helped us secure the space, had brought up the fact that, you know, typically um, folks, you know, when they can um, uh, pay some sort of rental fee or donation towards the senior center, they have not required that of us. Um, but we, one suggestion had been $50 for use of the, the room this evening. Another had been $75. Um, and I will add that uh, Larry, Larry mentioned that um, uh, we have a little bit of funds that he's been uh, pulling together. Um, uh, so about $150 if that didn't come through on the recording. So we have that money currently available if we would like. Um, do we have a second? Second. second. Um, any discussion? 
All those in favor then of donating $50 to the Senior Center of West Seattle for um, being uh, gracious enough to host uh, host our meeting this evening, um, please say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? No. We uh, so we are unanimous. Um, yeah. Um, so that is all I had. Um, is there any new business um, that needs to be brought up, or can we uh, get out of here? Oh, we were going to talk about sound trend. Um, well, so I'll stop. Is there any other new business? I did have one item on here. Okay, hearing none. Um, so we do not need to have this discussion now, and maybe we'll, we'll talk more at our, our board meeting. Um, if we had time, uh, we were going to talk about um, Sound Transit's plans for outreach um, to our community about light rail. Um, I have rethinked the link on here because uh, if folks, for some reason, are not aware, there was a big walk that happened um, a week or two ago. Um, and so we can talk about that. Um, uh, you know, Deb and I were there, and it was a little surprising. I mean, there were there were definitely pro light rail folks there in the crowd, um, but there was a good 35, 40 people. It was a very diverse crowd, age wise, spread around the neighborhood, new people versus old people. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we can have some again. We can we can talk uh, next month at the board meeting or you know offline, but. Uh, I think Deb and I were a little surprised, and 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 you know I think there there's definitely people who have, if there's not some growing opposition to light rail, that people are very freaked out again and feel like they're not getting questions answered. Um, uh, there's a big write up uh, if you go to uh, if you go to their website, which is rethinkthelink.org. Um, and I'll try and find the find it and forward it to the board as well. Um, that has photos of each stop and 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 does a really good summary of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Deb and I chatted a little bit about we might want to reach out to Sound Transit, maybe even invite Sound Transit to our board meeting, and let's really talk to them. You know, like if we we maintain that we are about educating um, our neighbors, but also lifting up. When concerns are, are are coming up there, and I think we might want to reach out to Sound Transit and kind of have a little frank discussion with them that if they're looking to start up outreach again here in October, like they need to come willing to answer some questions. And even if it, you know, it's really, I mean, you know, I work for government during the day. Like government does not want to be held down, doesn't want to say anything that they can't promise for sure, and be held to things. But they may need to really come out and say, hey, like this is not a legal opinion, but here's what happens elsewhere. Here's what's likely to happen in your station area. Or they may have to be willing to share some more pictures. Or maybe we need to do like we had a community member who did, you know, visuals early on and Sound Transit wasn't happy with us. But we were like, people want to see something. So if you're not going to show them, we're going to get them. We may have to do some similar things where like, there are folks in the community who'd be happy to talk about what they think the impact is going to be in their neighborhood and counting up the number of businesses that they think are going to be displaced. Um, there's a lot of support for some businesses like uh, the child care facility that's down in Delridge. And I will go into more detail later about why that's happening, because I've learned a lot more about why Sound Transit can and can't do some things with them. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that a lot of people send their kids there and are really concerned that we would take out one of the major child care facilities here in West Seattle. And so I just want to put that out there for people to think about, talk to other people, you know, ask questions, and we'll have some conversation at the board and maybe with the Sound Transit rep about, like, what are we asking them? Like, it can't just be their usual come out and put up some, you know, cute little easels and hope that everybody will just listen to whatever they say. I think people are going to be pretty demanding on wanting some answers. Um, yeah. So that's what I got. Anything else? All right. Well, I appreciate everyone hanging out. John, good to see your face, um, even if it's only on the screen. Um, and we will we'll, we'll talk to everybody soon. Bye.